music is maybe where you guys just, your parents say, keep quiet, right? Keep quiet, obey, like just have self-control. And then you start to understand the words a little by little. And maybe you try to follow your adult, your parents, for example, maybe not. But in general, you guys haven't had a lot of teaching on why we sing. Right. And then, so you, you're the whole point of singing is just have self control, stand there and pay attention. And then you go to next generation ministries. You don't learn about why we sing. And then you're here separate from your parents expected to sing. And so what I just made the observation last year, a lot of times while we are singing, it looks like a lot of you are still following your parents instruction. Just be self controlled, pay attention. Don't talk. But my concern is, and, and Chris's concern is, is your heart, is your mind engaged with the words? Why are we singing? Why are we doing what we're doing when we sing? Singing is something that we're commanded to do, sing to the Lord. And we're going to hear all about that today. But I wanted to tell you, as your, as your elder, as your pastor, as the leader of student ministries, I want you to know why we sing every time we sing and to shepherd your hearts, to even before you say the words for the rest of your life, give yourself a little sermon, just one or two sentences. Self, this is why we sing, and then tell yourself what that is. So today when Chris is talking, I want you to listen for what that one or two sentence self sermon is going to be, right? When you're going to tell yourself, get your heart right, get your mind right, and do what I'm supposed to do when I'm singing. Pay really close attention today so that you can figure out what that is. It's just a joy to be in, in here again. Um, I get to be with you this week, and then I get to be with you next week, and then we will move on to yet a new topic, and uh, we'll be excited about that one as well, but I'm excited about these. Um, I'm excited to talk about them together. Um, We're going to continue to do music in here. We're going to continue to invite you to sing, and it it really helps if we know why. Um, Let me just recap last week real quick. So last week we talked about um, true worship and and just a few like recap highlights, just in case maybe a lot happened since last week, and maybe uh, some things just kind of like got dimmer in your head. I'll just refresh real quick. First of all, we learned last week that, that true worshipers, God seeks true worshipers, um, true worshipers who want to give up their life of sin and their life of self-glorification and sacrifice that life to instead live, a lo- um, live to, to love and honor God with their whole lives. Uh, that was what we were talking about last week. Uh, true worshipers worship in spirit and truth, and it's with their whole life. And there's not a, um, uh, as we talked about, like, what this is, that, that's the whole reason that Christ died, right? Um, God sent his son to, to die for sinners so that any sinner who would believe in him could be a true worshiper whose whole life could be uh, honoring to God. And then um, we also kind of worked out what whole life worship was, right? What do we mean by whole life worship? Um, true worshipers do not compartmentalize their lives where there's like, these parts over here, we say, okay, these are for God. And this stuff over here, that's for me. Um, and I think that it's easy to get into that mentality sometimes. So it's good to remember what, what true worship really is as whole life and what that looks like. Um, and because true worshipers want to honor God with their whole lives, they care about what honors God and what doesn't honor God. They care. Um, they ask questions like, how do I live this part of my life to honor him because I don't want it to be compartmentalized, right? Um, what things can I do that honor him and what things do not honor God? So uh, a person who is a true worshiper of God uh, cares about that sort of thing. And in God's loving kindness to his people, he's actually revealed the answers to those questions in his word. Um, from the beginning of God's people, God gave them his law. And, and the reason for that, it, it was so that they would know him and know how to please him. In Deuteronomy, uh, all the way back at the beginning, when we read about the formation of God's people, um, it, it, 
Moses is talking to Israel on behalf of God. He says, now Israel, what does your Lord, or what does the Lord your God require from you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways and to love him and to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and to keep the Lord's commandments and his statutes, which I'm commanding you today for your good. Um, so you hear ever since the very beginning, God has sought true worshipers whose whole life is committed to, to them. Um, God's law, his scripture explains um, how to honor and worship God. Um, so the heart of a true worshiper treasures God's word, obeys it because it shows us how to live for him and how to honor him. So then the last one of the other things that we hit in this last one, I'll do as a recap, but, but God actually gives us things to do that honor him. And these, I call them last week, special acts of worship. And I, and I point that out because if we're talking about a whole life of worship, it's interesting to me that God gave us additional things, things that we wouldn't actually normally do in a normal life unless we're trying to do something special for God. So uh, in the Old Testament, there were festivals, there were feasts, uh, there were sacrifices, there were burnt offerings, there was incense, there was all the activities in the tabernacle and in the temple. Like these are not things they would do in a normal course of life, of like getting up, getting ready for the day. And yet getting up, getting ready for the day is something that we're supposed to honor the Lord with. If those who are true worshipers wake up in the morning and say, how do I wake up in the morning and honor my, my, my Lord who, who purchased me with precious blood? I mean, we should ask those questions if we're worshipers, right? But he gives us things in addition. Christian, if you're, not, if you're going throughout all of your day and all the big, amazing things and all the tiny, mundane things are given to the Lord in honor to him, here are a few other things that only my worshipers get to do. And we actually talked about what happens when non-worshippers of God go and do some of these special acts of worship. They actually become offensive to the Lord. I'm not going to obey you with anything in my life, but oh, I'm going to go give you this worship. I'm going to give you this one piece. I'm going to give you a sacrifice. Um, that was actually offensive to the Lord in many cases, and we learned about that. You know, in the New Testament, we have some of those special acts of worship. We have the church. We have fellowship that we come to on a Sunday. And we call it worship, don't we? Ever hear anybody use that term? Oh, I'm going to worship, which is true. It's not wrong. Um, but that's not the entirety of worship, is it? That's something that his, his followers do. And that's people who, um, and we'll, we'll learn more about that gathering. Another one is communion. Baptism. These are special acts of worship you wouldn't do in a normal day. They're special acts of worship that just his people do. Uh, sitting on the teaching of God's word together is something that worshipers do. Um, singing is something that worshipers do. And often, Jacob mentioned this, but often we learn to do these things by coming to church and kind of seeing and kind of going along with it. And sometimes I just got to admit, when we grow up in the church, we may not know why we do them. We just do them because it's a good thing to do. And frankly, there's nothing wrong with that. But you know what? If we take the time to learn, like what was the importance of this? Like what, what got this started? And, and why do we still do it? Do you know what that does? It starts to give us motivation, like, like purpose as to like why I show up to church and how I participate in the things that I do when I'm at church and not even at church, but other things he gives us to do, right? So it's important to know. And tonight we're going to focus on one of those. We're going to focus on singing and especially what, I, what, we, what we call corporate worship or corporate singing, okay? And it sounds kind of stale when we put it that way. So we're going to put it in hopefully 3D relief and, and uh, get you guys excited about why we sing and the participation of it. So the, the title of this was, Why Do Christians Sing? Um, and, and, you know, it is funny. Throughout all history, Christians have sung. Um, even before there were Christians, back in Old Testament times, God's people sang. Um, singing is throughout all the Old Testament. It's in the New Testament. And frankly, if you think of it, it's a little weird. Like there just aren't too many groups that gather and sing. Um, I mean, I think sometimes we gather to go like to a concert or something, and we might sing along. But even those, that's for the person on the stage. But like, there's something weird about a group of people that just gets together and they burst out into song, and some guy gets up there with a guitar, or some guy that gets up there with a guitar and tries to get you to sing. And then once everybody participates, if you don't, you feel like you're kind of missing out, right? And I don't know these songs. I need to learn these songs. It, it's just a little, it's a little different. Um, and I think it's, it's, if you wondered why that is, it's not just because it's a fun group activity or because somebody started it and now it's a good tradition and we just kind of keep going. Um, God's people 
have sung songs with great purpose and deep conviction in every season of life. It's worth asking, where did that come from? Uh, you know, I could answer that with two, question, two answers. There's the direct question, which is because we're told to. It's true. We're commanded to in Scripture. So, I mean, we could just run with that, right? Uh, but there's another, I could go a little bit deeper and say, okay, so but why were we told to? And that's where we're going to go. But let me just give you the short answer. The short answer is this, because God imbues singing with great ministry purpose for His church. He gives ministry, ministry to us in our singing. Um, so tonight, we're going to open God's Word and look at four important ministries of corporate singing that every Christian is called to. Four important ministries of corporate singing that every Christian is called to. So open your Bibles to Psalm 96. And we're going to read through this. I'm going to read through this. And I want you to follow along. And as I'm doing this, um, I want you to listen to a couple of things. But of these, I'll, I'll get us started with this. Of the four ministries that we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about, we're going to start with this first one. And the first one is, uh, go ahead and move to the next slide. There we go. The ministry of singing in worship to God to exalt and commune with Him. This is the first ministry of corporate worship. And it seems obvious, but it is the foundation of everything we're going to talk about tonight. So the first ministry of singing, we'll see this in this psalm and in many other psalms. Actually, psalms are full of these. Um, but the command and the ministry that is given is in worship to God, to sing in worship of, uh, to God and to exalt Him and to commune with Him. So let's read in Psalm 96 and listen for the command to sing and the reasons to sing, okay? Because there's, there's going to be a lot of them, and you don't have to trace them all. We'll, 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 go, we'll go over them, but just read along with me. I'll be reading uh, in the NASB version. If you're reading in some other version, that's absolutely fine. Just follow along with me. Uh, but, and, but look for the command to sing and the reasons to sing. Verse 1. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord, all the earth. Sing to the Lord. Bless His name. Proclaim good tidings of His salvation from day to day. Tell of His glory among the nations. His wonderful deeds among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He's to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before Him. Strength and beauty are in His sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord glory of His name. Bring an offering and come into His courts. Worship the Lord in holy attire. Tremble before Him all the earth. Say to the nations, the Lord reigns. Indeed, the Lord is firmly established. It will, not, um, it will not be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all it contains. Let the field exult and all that is in it. Then all the trees of the forest will sing for joy before the Lord for he is coming, for He is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in His faithfulness. So in this psalm, God's people are given specific commandments, actually, to worship and instructions. Why? In what ways? And, and we could probably spend all evening in just this psalm, but we're actually going to go to a bunch of other places just so you can see this. Um, but let's look at a couple of these. What, what were some of the reasons? Um, well, first of all, look at verse 1 and 2, and, and you can see the commands right there. Those are imperatives or commands. Sing to the Lord is a commandment. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing a new song. He's deserving of not just singing the same old song all the time, but let's come up with a new one. <laughs> let's not make it rote. Um, there's actually some doctrinal significance to the new songs that are talked about in Scripture. But, and then it, and then it says, sing to the Lord, and then it, it tells us things we're to do in that. Bless His name. 
Proclaim good tidings of His salvation from day to day. Tell of His glory among the nations. What does that sound like? That sounds like uh, exalting. <laughs> you know what I mean? Is to exalt. What, what does exalt mean? Anybody know? Yeah. Okay, to lift up, to make higher. That's right. And can we make, actually, that's, that's some good definition maybe to think about. Can we make God higher than He is? No. Can we make Him any more glorious than He is by saying so? No, no. But, but if we exalt His name, if we exalt Him among the peoples, that means people that maybe didn't think of Him as high, we get to tell them He is. Later when it says, ascribe glory and strength to the Lord. You know what ascribe means? I am, I am telling you that we need, to, we need to attach the idea of glory and strength to this God. Not this God. This God. That's ascribing glory. And that's, that's what we're doing. We're exalting God. And this whole psalm is about that. And it is foundational to why we sing. So often when Scripture sings, and, and there's, there are a bunch of other references actually. Yeah, right there. Um, that just tell you, sing. <laughs> and and that's that's wonderful. And and you know what? The, the fact that we're supposed to exalt the Lord, this is part of the reason why when we choose songs here at Grace Bible Church, um, we, we actually choose them carefully because like, what are we singing about? Uh, well, a lot of them you'll notice are about ascribing uh, strength, honor, glory, majesty, greatness, faithfulness, goodness, all of his character, uh, exalting all of his character attributes. Um, it's good for us to do that. And Scripture says that it is so. So when we get together, um, God wants us to direct our hearts and our minds toward exalting Him, singing in His goodness, of His goodness, His faithfulness, His sovereignty, His loving kindness, His salvation, His glories of His salvation. And, and who else to do this but the people who know these things about Him, His people. Scripture instructs, instructs us and demonstrates what kinds of songs we sing, what themes, things that are glorifying and good for us to sing. Glorifying to God, good for us. Um, according to this psalm, why are we to sing exalting things about God? Did you see some of those? Look at verse um, 4 through 6. Why? <laughs> for great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the people are idols, but the Lord made the heavens Splendor and majesty are before Him. Strength and beauty are in His sanctuary. Why? Because He's worthy. <laughs> right? I mean, add all that up. Why, why would we sing to this God and not to all these other gods that the world likes to serve? Because this God is the real God. Because He's actually worthy of, of, of lifting up and make, being made much of. How are we to worship Him? I mean, if we just kept going through this psalm, there's just so many helpful things. Uh, verse 9 and 10, it looked like, how should we do it in holy attire? By the way, that doesn't necessarily just mean, like, I got to be wearing a tie or something. But, like, are we prepared? Do we prepare ourselves to stand before a holy God and offer a sacrifice of praise? Tremble before him, verse 9 and 10 says. Testify among the nations of God's sovereignty. That's how we're supposed to be. We're, all of these things matter. You guys. Just did that a moment ago. We lifted him up. We proclaimed that the nations should hear his voice. Uh, should, should sorry, should hear our voices proclaiming his greatness. Um, so we are to be reverent in such a way that testifies to the nations, even by singing of our God's glory and our greatness. This is just one of the many passages, obviously, that instruct us to sing to God of God's glory, to sing of his attributes, to lift praises to him because of his greatness and his worthiness. So this is the first and foundational ministry of corporate singing. And um, it, it's the basis on which all the others operate. So singing and worship to God and about God in worship. That's the first ministry that you're doing. What's the second one? Well, the second one is to sing corporately. That means all together. That's what corporate means, by the way. The ministry of, we have the ministry of singing in ministry to each other. So while you're singing in worship to God, exalting Him and communing with Him, there's also a ministry um, in singing to each other. And this is a very, very important element. This is why we're talking about corporate worship. And you can't do this when you're alone, by the way. Um, there is a ministry 
of just singing to yourself. But what we're talking about is corporate worship. Uh, look at Colossians 3.16. I've actually got it up here, so you can just look here with me. Colossians 3.16 says, Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Do you hear this? Here we, here we see another unique ministry of what's happening, a ministry that you have, a ministry that I have, when we get together as a church and we sing all together. So while we're doing the first ministry we looked at, singing of God's greatness, salvation, extolling Him and, and worship, we also have an active ministry to each other when we sing. And the, the command here is actually to let the Word of Christ richly dwell with you. When we're obedient to this, letting the Word of Christ, which is actually fundamentally the Gospel and then more broadly all of God's Word, when we let that dwell in us richly, there's a ministry that is to flow from us. We teach and admonish each other with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing. How? Singing with thankfulness. Do you guys see that? Have you ever read that and wondered, how, how, how does this work? Um, it's, it's such an important ministry. When we sing to God in thankfulness about what is true, our singing is a potent ministry of God's Word to each other in the church. Put another way, there's something about how um, people who are transformed by the grace of the gospel, by the truth of the gospel, there's something about the way that we're transformed that we grow in understanding and wisdom of what daily life in Christ is like. We, we start to recognize the realities of His truth and all the glories of His salvation. And then we overflow with thankfulness in our hearts to God, bringing a natural disposition to want to encourage one another with it. And an important way to do this is the songs that we sing when we're together. All the songs that we sing are to be full of the rich truths and wisdom that cause us to overflow in thanksgiving to our Savior. And in doing this together, we teach and admonish each other with spiritual truth that we need to hear. You know, um, just as a parallel, Paul writes of the same ministry that you have, uh, to the Ephesians, um, he says in Ephesians 5.18, he says, Be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your, uh, making melody with your heart to the Lord even. So you're singing, and there's a melody even in your heart. I got, I got to tell you, this, this, is, uh, this is good for me because I get to, I get to encourage people to sing but i got to be honest with you, uh, sometimes I see people singing and it doesn't look like there's a melody in their heart. You know what I'm talking about? You know people like this? They'll say the words, but it's like, boy, you are not happy about this. Or you are bored to be here. Um, this, is, this is one of the things that grace does. is It gives us just like a reason. Now, you may not be as excited and caffeinated as I am right now all the time. Uh, it's been a long day, but I'm just I'm, I'm thankful and really excited to be here about this because... If you know that you're singing to people next to you and that they need to hear this truth, it, it gives you purpose and a ministry that you can fulfill. Friends, this is a ministry to me. In those seasons of life, when life is just hard, um, when I'm struggling, spiritually maybe even, I need to hear that conviction of the church that God is good, God is sovereign of God's loving kindness never failing. God's mercy is greater than my sin. God is near to the brokenhearted. He is your stronghold. I need to hear that, that He's your stronghold. That encourages me. And that He's glorious and trustworthy. So, so participate. Sing in solidarity with your brothers and sisters. Remind us when we forget. Convince us when our faith is struggling. Let us hear you rejoice with gladness of your salvation so that I'm encouraged so that when some of us may be struggling to find joy and have joy, you know what they hear? They hear all the reasons and it's coming from all the voices around them. Remind us of your need for a Savior by singing from your heart about your need for your Savior, about your hope in His glorious gospel. Participate. Don't 
withhold. God has given you this ministry in His church. So, we've got two ministries so far. The first one is in worship to God to exalt and commune with Him. The second one is to the ministry of singing in ministry to each other. And the third one is in ministry to sing in ministry to one's own soul. This one, you don't have to be anywhere with other people. You can do this, but that's not corporate singing. So we're going to bring it into the church right now. Psalm 42 was actually written for a choir director. I love it. By the way, that's actually in the Hebrew. Like I'm learning Hebrew, and you read the very first thing in a, in a first line of a psalm, and you know what it says? To the choir director. <laughs> and I'm thinking, oh, that's awesome. I want to be a choir director now. This is to me. Um, but Psalm 42 is a song. It's a song that was meant to be sung. It's a, it's a prayer expressing the people's need for God's protection and help. And, and, and notice who the audience is in many of the lines of this song. Notice who the audience is in some of these lines. I'm just going to read a couple, but Psalm 42, verse 5. Do we have that one as a slide too? Yeah, look at this. Why are you in despair? Oh, my soul. It's being sung corporately. And who's he talking to? He's talking to himself. Every person singing is speaking to their own soul. Why are you in despair, O oh my soul? And why have you become disturbed within me? Hope in God. This is an imperative. And who's talking? I am. Who am I talking to? Me. Soul, listen up. Hope in God. For I shall again praise Him for the help of His presence. There's like two or three psalms that have this exact line in it. I love it. Soul, <laughs> listen. Listen up. Hope in God. You ever need to just tell yourself that? You ever just need to tell yourself, soul, why are you down? You know, it's meant, it's meant to be sung in corporate setting, which means you're getting all these ministries in one. Ministry one, you're exalting God because you're talking about the help of His presence. You're talking about His greatness. So, number two, you're hearing hundreds of people. If you're on a Sunday morning and you sing a song like this, you hear 480-some, 490-some on given Sunday voices. I don't know if you guys get to hear it where you sit on a Sunday morning. If you're sitting toward the back, you're barely hearing any of it because you're hearing the wall. But if you're sitting toward the front, you get all these voices just washing over you. I get the best seat in the house. I stand in front of y'all and you're all looking at me and you're singing, hopefully as loud as you can, and I hear 480 voices, 490, almost 500 voices confirming these things. And you know what? When we sing, oh my soul, these people are also singing to their own soul, ministering to their own soul with the Word of God. Uh, Psalm 103 is one of my favorite psalms and, and my, my grandfather used to say this all the time. He'd say, bless the Lord, oh my soul. And I was like, oh, that's great. You know, when, when he was young, I just, I just mimic that. Bless the Lord, oh my. But then it, I realized why he loves this song. He's preaching to himself. And it was to music too. Sometimes when he did it, he'd sing it. <laughs> but bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and forget none of his benefits. Who pardons all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with loving kindness and compassion, who satisfies your years with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. Do you ever forget that is who you're praising? Do you ever forget these benefits? Like how often do you wake up in the morning and that's like, that's a song on my heart. I'm just, on, I'm just immediately thinking that. I don't. Did you know? I, I mean, I've got this sick heart that the Lord is having to just redeem all the time. And when I wake up in the morning, I wake up like this. <sighs> you know what my heart's telling me? This day is going to stink. This is a hard day. you got hard things ahead of you. you got hard people in front of you. you got hard assignments in front of you. And you're going to be terrible at half of it. None of it's going to go right. Does anybody else ever wake up like, I mean, you don't have to confess, but I'm confessing. Anybody else ever wake up like that? Um, I think this is what this is. I'm like 
old, I, I boot up as old like versions of me, you know, and then I have to put on Christ. It's like an old computer you boot up and it's running old software, you know, um, an old iPhone you boot up and you're like, wow, this is like version 1.0. These are helpful. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. And he says it over and over. If you just added this up, like the benefits of that should cause you to want to sing if you really, if this was your reality. And that's what the psalmist is hoping for. So this is a ministry, a ministry to your own soul to sing scripture like this, to sing songs that speak truth that you need to hear regularly. And as we just talked about, it's truth that your, that your people next to you need to hear too. This is why we got all three of these stacked now. Um, I know I could go down a rabbit hole trail about this, but I'll just mention it here. There's something special about music <laughs> um, and singing in particular that touches the soul, doesn't it? God has designed music, even music without lyrics. Have you noticed this? Even music without lyrics. I'm a musician. I studied music. I've, I've listened to all kinds of music, and it just grabs me. And maybe, you know, I've heard people say, yeah, you're a music guy. That's why it does it for you. Everybody, I, I'm, I guarantee you, go to a movie and listen to the soundtrack. It will tell you you should be scared, and you know what? You are. <laughs> it should tell you it's intense, and you're like, wow, this is intense. I'm feeling it. It, it tells you that there's a victorious moment or this elation or this high or this low or a sad or creepy. You, ever, you know the creepy? It's not just sound effects. Sometimes it's music. Music has this power. God just designed it for that. You know what? I'm convinced it's meant to minister to your soul. Now, the world does all sorts of things to it and makes it into their own purpose and their own art for their own things, but you feel it. Music has this ability, designed it to affect us, and Scripture says, sing truth to your own soul and worship to God and use it in ministry. So when our hearts are heavy, fearful, apathetic, sinfully distracted, we need to be diligent to stop listening to our heart, and we must preach truth to ourselves. And the fact that God gave us music that has this effect, that's pretty cool. I mean, I can quote poetry to myself. I can quote Scripture, and that's good. But put to a good melody, it's easy to remember. And honestly, it, gra it grabs me different. So when somebody has artfully, with way more gifting and talent than I have, has written a song, that has a melody to it that grabs you, and they put it to truth that will not be forgotten because it just has a hook. Praise the Lord for that, right? I don't know what you've been through in your life. I don't know what trials you've been through. It, it, maybe you've been through some horrific things. Maybe you haven't yet, praise the Lord. But there are times where all you've got is a song to remind you of this truth, and it, it sticks in your head. Can I just encourage you? Get it stuck now. Get good songs stuck in your head right now. It will, it will minister to you and your soul as you go through trials. On good days, when something amazing happens, it will remind you to praise the Lord. We try to choose songs here. I try to choose songs here at GBC that pretty much just throw a dart and hit any of the songs that we sing. And there's going to be some truth there that will minister to your soul in times of need. So I just want to encourage you with that. Last ministry. So we sing to our, our own soul. That's a ministry. Last ministry is in ministry to unbelievers among us and to a watching world. You know, we, we, we actually heard this in the psalm that we just read. Psalm 96. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. In verse 1, 2, 3, this is how it starts. Sing to the Lord, bless His name, proclaim good tidings of His salvation from day to day. Tell of His glory among the nations. His wonderful deeds among all the peoples. Sounds funny. I guess in English these days, we don't usually say peoples. That means people groups. More types of people, more languages, more tongues, more nations. Every type of person there is out there needs to hear this. 
Even later on in that same passage, worship the Lord in verse 9 and 10. Worship the Lord in holy attire. Tremble before Him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. <laughs> Say among the nation. You know what it's talking about here? Be, be confident. Tell them of your confidence of God. Look at what it says. The Lord reigns. Indeed, the world is firmly established and it will not be moved and He will judge the peoples with equity. Guys, justice is coming. What He established can't be moved. Of all the things going on in my life right now that seem uncertain, this is not, you know, this is said among the nations. When we sing, we are to sing in such a way that it testifies to a watching and listening world. Our God is real. This is who He is. He's awesome. He's sovereign. He's good. And salvation is by Him and through Him only. And we are confident in this. That's how you're to sing. Um, in the New Testament, even uh, in 1 Corinthians 14, there's this kind of part where Paul's actually talking about t speaking in tongues and prophecy and stuff. And he's trying to like help the church understand, like, what is that all about? But there's this part where he says, if all prophesied, and he's talking about um, speaking truth. If, if all were proclaiming truth and an unbeliever walks in or an ungifted man, one who doesn't really understand this stuff, but there's a guy who's gifted at proclaiming truth and he walks in, He's convicted by all. He is called to account by all. The secrets of his heart are disclosed and he will fall on his face and worship God, declaring that God is certainly among you. So what's the outcome? What are we supposed to do with this then? When you assemble, each of one of you has a psalm, which is often sung, has a teaching, has a revelation, has a tongue, has an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. Look, Paul just instructs us, be aware, there are non-believers among us. In this very room, sitting with us in the pews that we love. We're to prioritize proclaiming truth among us and edifying each other with the truth, knowing that these, these people are, are among us. And this includes the priority of singing truth, teaching truth. And as we sing truth in worship to God, in ministry to one another, and in ministry to our own soul, this is evangelistic. Evangelistic. To any unbelievers in our midst. And, and you know what? A, a world watching? Wonders too. I've got a question. How effective do you think any of these ministries are? Like even this one. How, how effective do you think this ministry is to an unbeliever sitting next to you if you just choose not to sing? Or how about you're singing, but you're bored. There's no melody in your heart. What are you communicating? Does the unbeliever think, wow, these people really believe this stuff? Wow, this is really important. It must be important. Look at them sing. Maybe I should pay attention. This is really compelling. There's a way to sing. Um, I don't mean act, but when we're fervent in singing to the Lord with all our heart, like we just read in Deuteronomy, right? People sit up and notice, and they're like, wow, these people really believe this. They really believe this. this. This must be really important. I'm really in awe of how devoted these people are. That's how you sing. And when you have had a hard week and you're singing with everything you've got because of the hope of the Lord with this song that comes up, who is like the Lord our God? <laughs> the guy next to you whose heart is just broken is ministered to. And sometimes your own soul, when you get swept up in the music, your own soul is ministered to. Just a couple of takeaways and I'll let you go so you guys can talk about this. Just remember, singing with the church is both worship to God and rich ministry that all Christians are called to. Not just the people up front. They all are. If you're, if you're a Christian, you're, you're, you're called to do the ministry. And, and if you're not certain and you're not a Christian, then this ministry is for you as well. It's for you. Be encouraged by it. Be strengthened by it. Secondly, seeing these ministries and singing in, of singing in Scripture and understanding their purpose, this gives us a biblical why. Right? It gives us motivation. And it should motivate us to participate well as part of our sacrifice 
a personal service of worship that we talked about, our spiritual service of worship. Not just because I'm asked to, not because everybody else is in its peer pressure, or, because, or not even just because I like to sing. I hear that. Oh, I don't like to sing. doesn't matter. It's your, it's, your, it's your spiritual service of worship to the Lord, and it's a ministry to the church. Don't withhold. We worship because we want to serve and worship God. And we want to serve in the ministries He's given us. And we're leaning into a rich and important ministry in the body of Christ. It should also shape how we participate in this ministry um, corporately and personally. I, let me just mention, next week, we get to talk about, okay, if this is the why, how? Like, how do you go about doing it? There's a lot of misnomers about singing. And I hope to maybe dispel a few of those and encourage you all just to just do it with all you got. Not worry about maybe doing it wrong. Um, the Lord instructs us, and we can follow that. And so, um, but here, yeah, it these ministries shape the songs we choose, how we lead songs, how we invite the church to participate and respond, the role of the music leaders, the qualifications of the music musicians. The entire philosophy of ministry here is driven and regulated by God's Word, and it's encouraging. It should challenge us to personally sing with purpose, engage with the truth in our minds and the hearts that we sing to our God in ministry to each other, to our own heart, and to a watching nation. And just pray for us. Lord, thank you for the just the revelation of your word. You just reveal so much to us that we just wouldn't even know. Thank you for these ministries. I pray that we would be compelled to do them well, that that whether we're singing in here or in, in our church or in other settings, Lord, that we would keep these in mind and take them seriously and then rejoice in the fact that we can be useful even in doing this. In Jesus' name, amen. Chris, thank you so much. That, that was good, everybody. Thank you, Chris. What we just heard was a lot. That was like a fire hose and you need to take in every little bit of what you heard and be able to preach it to yourself. Chris talked about preaching to your soul. Soul, this is why I'm singing now. We heard so much, probably more than you can even remember. So I want to let you know, we send these messages to your parents home in the email. You can watch them again and we send the outlines and the discussion guide to your parents, I would encourage you this week to tell your parents what you heard. Tell them what you remember and then ask them to help you review this because you know what's gonna happen one week from today? You're gonna get to do this. You're gonna get to, in the morning, stand up with the body of Christ and sing. And you need to tell yourself, self, I am singing in worship to God and I'm gonna minister to all these other people here. I'm going to minister to my own soul and there's non-believers and I get to proclaim the goodness and glory of God to them. You have a week to review that so that you don't waste the opportunity. So let's go to discussion groups. We're going to have about 15 minutes there, but please then continue the discussions at home with your parents. Thanks. <clears throat>